have so many different ways to experience nature. We can kind of do it um, in, an, in an embodied sense where you're physically out in nature, touching, smelling, feeling, experiencing. Or you can have a relationship that's more scientific. Um, or you can have a relationship that's kind of like these volcanoes where it's it's more a vista, so it's like meant to be stared at and appreciated from a distance. And um, I guess I'm, I'm interested in all these different perspectives that, that we carry um, in regard to um, the environment that we live in that we can't live without, um, but we still have these strange distanced relationship to. My name is Amé Bobien. I'm an artist that lives and works in Chicago, Illinois. I build immersive installations that are photo-based, and I hope that you get the opportunity to walk through into the hothouse. My name is Jeffrey Kenny. I'm associate curator with Mason Exhibitions. I'm here with Amé Bobien, um, and we're just going to discuss how things got started, how things evolved, um, and this marks the, the closing of the exhibition. Um, so thinking back to when I first contacted you, um, I think I did my initial research around March of 2023 and um, presented to our exhibition committee. Um, I was looking for artists and ideas that dealt with the natural world, um, botanical subject matter, um, but specifically looking for artists that approached environmental concerns from um, different avenues, so not addressing the really large questions, but um, thinking about those that were somehow enacting new relationships um, to the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember for showing everyone your work, and um, it was, I think it was the lead slide in my presentation, and I remember it, like it sort of set the tone. Everyone was sort of um, really impressed, really stoked about your work. I think it was the first time for everyone there they had seen it. Um, so there was an initial excitement. Even the idea of doing something immersive, um, but with so much uh, kind of um, maker craft involved, I think was something that was really appealing to everyone. Um, and then I contacted you shortly after there, and I was so happy that you, you, were, you were into it, and right off the bat. So um, do you remember this time? Do you remember? I totally do. Okay. Um, your email landed on my spam folder. <laughs> and so luckily, I retrieved it. And um, as soon as I put it into my regular inbox, um, I think the, the request was just for a studio visit, and I didn't know what it would lead to. But as soon as we had our initial Zoom studio visit, um, I was instantly excited about all the possibilities. Right. I think that um, when, I'm, when, I'm thinking, when I'm making something, I am trying to understand what the experience would be for someone who's never seen my work before. Um, what types of sensations are they going to experience? What are they going to respond to? Um, I know c the color palette, like this un, um, unrestrained color palette is the first kind of register probably. So people were wandering by this open doorway and they were saying, oh, I just was paying attention to how colorful everything is. So I think that, that right away, that's very inviting. You know, it's, it's, um, it has a, a particular type of energy that it broadcasts. Um, and then I'm also thinking about how, as you're moving through this space, there are all these subtle repetition of visual motifs that unfold. So you're going to see leaves that are photographs of leaves. You're going to see those leaves directly beside actual leaves. And in this instance, um, sometimes it's hard to discern which one is the photograph and which one is the real leaf. Um, you're going to see leaves that are 
metal on metallic surfaces on fabric um, that have leaves that have been gold leafed leaves that have been pressed and dried uh, and then also drawn on with a 3, 3d pen and so i like that um, these are all materials that we encounter in our everyday lives so everyone's going to have some recognition of a leaf but they you know like i'm i'm interested in like what level of consciousness they're experiencing the accumulation of all these wide variety of leaves Yeah, I think that um, some of the treatment looks as if maybe moss could be growing on the tree branch. Yeah. And then others, it's very unrealistic color. But I, I think about like how, and again, my brain is kind of a photographic brain, that's my training. So I think about how there are all sorts of lens-based practices where we just ascribe a particular color to something um, like in science, um, so that we understand what the imaging is telling us, you know? So, uh, like photographs of the universe are incredibly colorful, but that's manufactured color. That's not what the universe really looks like, but it can, it can describe the atmosphere in a, in a way that our brains can comprehend. Um, color is not always obvious. And it changes in different light qualities, um, different times of day, different seasons. Uh, and I, I think about it like all these kind of like unseen color palettes too. So um, for the branches, uh, my parents had a, were in Hurricane Ian, and after the storm, after the hurricane passed over their house, my dad showed me photographs that he had taken of my mom's garden and the garden got destroyed and there were just heaps and heaps and heaps of branches uh, piled up and then a couple days later there was a storm in my neighborhood and our tree dropped a whole bunch of branches and so i grabbed those branches and i started drawing on them with a 3d pen really it was kind of like a meditative practice like i was really kind of thinking and worrying about my parents and um their circumstances related to the hurricane and then everybody in that region. Uh, and so in a way it was kind of like giving life to something that had just broken from its main life support, uh, reanimating it. And then after I did all the drawings on them, I started suspending them in my, in my well first I tried building a freestanding sculpture. And so I had all the branches just kind of like, almost like in a teepee form, and then um, wove them together a little bit with paracord. But uh, it seemed too stable. So I really wanted the branches to hang in space. Um, I wanted them to be in suspended states. So they're detached from a tree, but they're not on the ground. And so there's still this in-between state that they're experiencing. Uh, and then I had the branches hanging in my studio and I really wanted um, people to bump into them and make noises with them as they kind of clink together. Um, but the experience that I had when I brought friends into my studio is that uh, they didn't want to get too close to them. They were worried that they were going to hurt them. But this material is actually really hardy. It's pretty strong. Uh, so then I decided that I needed to figure out a way to animate them myself, to make them move. 
And so I hired a former student to build a motor for me that um, would make these gently sway in space. So it almost feel as if there was um, a, like they were breathing or there was a breeze or uh, they have um, like some of their own energy or if you're walking through here, you might think you bumped into them and not realize that they're moving the entire time. And, and yes, we did throw tons of possibilities at you. <laughs> <laughs> we had all kinds of things, because in, in, when you're curating something, like you don't know what, like, what you're doing, you're kind of trying to mark themes, mm -hmm. but then you have to actually find the artist that is kind of working through those. So there was kind of a, I think, a dialogue, I hope, that, um, about what I was thinking, what I was trying to get across, and then how your work did that or how, you know. So we initially were considering possible group things, but then it just mm -hmm. seemed kind of inevitable that you needed the space, you wanted the space um, to explore something bigger. I so. remember Don asking, do you think you can handle all this space? Yes. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, I was also interested in seeing where the whole discussion would um, eventually evolve. Right. So it was all going in the right direction. So. Yes, and, that, and I think for us, that was <laughs> like the big, um, the big, the only question we had was like the work looks awesome, mm -hmm. um, logistically figuring out. But you, you know, there's always that that feeling that maybe this person doesn't know if they can do it. You know, mm -hmm. and um, so that was like uh, something that as soon as the work arrived, I was like, oh, she's got it. <laughs> Although the, when it first came in, it came in it was so ne neatly packed. Yeah. I was like, I don't know how this is going to transform into this this full environment. Until I started unpacking, and then you really saw how much material yes. was hidden yeah. in the boxes. <laughs> and we didn't even get everything that I think came. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So then the installation period was really interesting because I, you know, I kind of observed your work from afar, mm -hmm. kind of talked to you, kind of sort of understood what the, the, the making part was, I guess. But the installation part is so integral to it that it was really, I think, interesting for all of us to see is not only how much you do on your own, mm -hmm. you know, like I think as exhibitors, we're used to like kind of getting directions, right. you know, maybe one artist will show up to install <laughs> their one piece because it's very particular, but um, you were very almost certain that this is something you had to do on your own, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really a, an amazing sort of talent to feel, um, you know, that you, th this is that part of, of your work, right? That, Definitely. That it doesn't end when, it, when it's, you know, put together in the studio. Mm. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, are there things as far as the installation that um, you learned or that you know? Yeah, there, I mean, there were so many things that I learned. Um, one thing that I do in preparation for any type of show is um, I try to pre-visualize the landscape of the exhibition space. And then I'll um, work out certain particular elements in my own studio, and I'll also time things, like how long will it take me to really um, install this part so I can start budgeting within the install period. Right. So that's part, that's part of the biggest challenge, is like how much can I get done in this um, X amount of time? Uh, and then I think for this space, I gave myself, well, um, I knew exactly where I wanted to start. And then I knew that once uh, um, I completed that starting point, whatever became the next move would determine the entire show. Right. And so while I was preparing um, the, the entrance to this exhibition space, um, I knew that that would take me two solid days. Right. And then my brain was like mapping out the puzzle like in thousands of different configurations, right. which I shared a little bit with you, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just gonna overwhelm Jeff if right. I like really reveal right. my thought process. Right. But it's, I'm making millions of decisions. And all I've, along and the I've way. heard you talk about that, like that's part of your studio practice. Like yeah. pick something that's laborious while yeah. you're thinking of the other things that it, it's exactly. going to develop into. Exactly. Yeah. So it's nice to see that that's kind of like both a, on the small scale and the mm -hmm. big, the large scale. Definitely. And I think we've talked about that 
concept of the micro and the macro, mm -hmm. even when we were trying to develop text or, you know, oh, I, was, yeah. I was really trying to figure out um, how to write about this mm -hmm. because um, you haven't generated a ton of writing, although in your, your, um, your lectures, they're very thorough mm -hmm. and coming from this like, which I find um, the lectures are really amazing because they kind of weave together um, the story of your family background, mm -hmm. your sort of local environment, mm -hmm. and how these things kind of continually feed into um, this ever-expanding process. Mm -hmm. And there is kind of the micro and the macro, right? Like the small scale, the large scale, like you're always toggling between those. And when I was trying to think of the writing and trying to tie this into our larger concerns with how it how um, we're addressing the natural world, right? Um, I think that was the thing that I kept coming back to is that like, um, if you talk about enclosure, a hot house is a large enclosure, but then right. your physical manipulation of materials is often these small scale enclosures or intertw intertwinements right. um, that are kind of metaphors mm -hmm. as well to maybe our, our larger confusion or um, uh, inseparable relationship to the natural world. Um, as far as like themes, do you ever start with like a large theme in mind or is it all? Hmm. I guess uh, once I landed on Hot House, that just became the catch all right. because it just seems to support all of these efforts. Um, yeah. And it and it also encapsulates my background, which is in collage. And so I right. kind of think about a hothouse as being an extension of that collage gesture. Right. So I guess I, I, I don't, right. I mean, I, since that's the nucleus, you know, like everything right. just kind of expands right. out from that. Right. My whole background is in collage. So for me, this feels like walking through a three-dimensional collage. So collage is a wide variety of materials that kind of like um, come into a heated environment and interact with each other. So this to me feels like an extension of that collage practice, um, but it's in a more dimensional space. And I, I don't know, like I think I, my training is in photography, but even as I was learning photography, I was always cutting up photographs and putting them back together. So this is cutting up materials and building new spaces with them. My studio is much smaller, so everything is um, dense, much more claustrophobic, but in a good way. <laughs> I have all sorts of different types of activities that I'm working on kind of simultaneously. Um, and I go through periods where I'm working really hard trying to evolve a particular relationship with materials. And then once I feel like I've amassed enough um, quantity and quality, then I move on to um, testing other materials. So I'm always trying to like um, discover something new in physical properties, um, find um, exciting materials to work with and to reconsider in ways that are exciting and fresh to me. Yeah, and 
we had these like really amazing conversations, I thought, about, um, you know, because I feel like part of my job in curating is kind of like playing this, um, I don't know, uh, we're platforming something, but we're also kind of the first interpreter. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to figure out a, a way to interpret this for the public when they come, mm -hmm. um, so that they at least have some, some touchstones, some, some ways to unpack what they're seeing. And, um, you know, I was just going, <laughs> every, every day I felt like I had a new thought, like, oh, well, have we touched on this, you yeah. know? Um, a, a couple th particular things was like, that I think we kind of learned together. We were talking about the mechanics of, um, which was the new addition to the show, having right. things move mechanically. Right. And um, we kind of, you know, I was saying this kind of, and we had some visitors that came in and said this is kind of like a life support system. It totally. reminded them of hospitals. And for me, it kept registering with um, printing technology and having those kind of two valences mm -hmm. was interesting. And I, um, you know, that this is both a means of supporting nature, but also this endlessly replicating kind of system that you've made. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it was one thing that was really exciting for me was to have this kind of like solitary experience building this world. But then knowing that you were just on the other side, like working on your curatorial statement, yeah. and then every once in a while you jump inside and ask me a question, and then yeah. it would evolve into some other conversation, and then you make another dash back to your um, desk. And so <laughs> it, w it was as if. Um, you were kind of like weaving together the narrative while yeah. I was weaving together the visuals. Right. And that was, that was ex an exciting um, thing for me to experience. And honestly, um, I, I really appreciated that you struggled to figure out a way to, to touch on so many right. different aspects, because that's what I struggle with. <laughs> right. And I kind of felt it needed, you know, not yeah. all, every exhibition, sometimes it's better if it's just in a nutshell. Yeah. But kind of mimicking what you were doing mm -hmm. and what I was, I was seeing you kind of literally unpack things right. and put things up, and then it, it was like a kind of a new understanding of the work, because I was feeling it in the space. Mm -hmm. But also questions like, you know, like how do, you know, I was doing a lot of the colored light stuff and I kept right. thinking about like, what is colored light in an art exhibition? You know, like it has a different um, sense than just lighting, like it's adding, Atmosphere. literally. Yeah, and, and so, so that awesome. even that Atmosphere. idea of like how the space sort of adds mm -hmm. something to it and how to maybe pull that out. And I don't, I don't always feel like writing can justify it. You know, I felt, I found myself like, putting lists of things, and I was like, this is so much like a maze process, you know, yeah. like this plus this plus this plus this. Right. So, um, so um, from the artist's perspective, um, working with a curator, the curator really tets, sets the tone for the exhibition. Right. And um, one thing that I was so uh, grateful for was um, how open you were and how our con conversations were constantly evolving. And um, much like my work, um, being so maximalist and kind of like including everything, you kept you kept generating more ideas, yeah. and then um, that generative process was something that was really exciting for me. Right. Uh, and then also, oftentimes um, exhibitions or exhibition opportunities, the artist is responsible for the programming, mm -hmm. in addition to right. delivering the work. Yeah. And so it was very exciting for me to just be a fly on the wall and see all the programming that right. you um, spun out of um, issues that were related to or in the universe of my work. Right. So I was yeah. grateful for that. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's part of what we, I think we try to do is that it's a, um, at least my perspective on curatorial, you know, like there's some curators that, it, you know, they have sort of a, a message to get across and like mm -hmm. everything is kind of, you know, it's a little bit more dictatorial maybe, like they want to they wanna make sure it's like within their mm -hmm. text already or whatever they have. And we approach things a little bit more collaboratively. Mm -hmm. um, I personally um, think that it's, what, what I do is about the artist mm -hmm. and it's, and the audience. So. I, the curator for me is just like kind of an intermediary, you know, um, figuring out how best to 
do what you need to do and right. every artist is different you know some want it to be a little bit more have a little bit more tightly mm -hmm. um, selected uh, thing and some are you know I could tell you wanted it to be open like you right I was always <laughs> like I don't know like I think um, you know she's not uh, um, providing me with a ton of like texts and stuff to mm -hmm. kind of go off which kind of indicates that you wanted to be you wanted to see where things go totally. rather than like represent something and make sure that that thing's presented the way it's always been mm -hmm. um, so that's very refreshing and, and then as far as like the programming um, I mean we work I work with a really great team um, I don't always feel like I'm the greatest programming person and I think artists sometimes are the same way like yeah. not quite sure <laughs> like how what does the so um, you know, Don Russell, Yasmin Salem, um, Alyssa Maru, all bringing in great ideas about, especially on a university campus, we have so many different um, possible generators. You know, we have musicians um, that can bring, uh, you know, we actually had a musician that, that performed in here with your show, um, that we've worked on it with other things. Um, we've had, uh, we work with the Chu Center, which is a, a creative part of our creative writing department um, programming poetry readings they were extremely excited to have this as the the backdrop for their event That's so cool. um, and we tried to nestle it in mm -hmm. um, and then we are always looking for uh, workshop ideas to try to integrate what we do with what the students might be mm -hmm. working on or maybe what they haven't tried yet mm -hmm. um, so that's where I was developing the cyanotype idea because partly one of the ways I see your work is that um, you take very approachable kind of basic skills as mm -hmm. far as making and are able to turn those basic skills into something much more ambitious right something that's um, more than the sum of its parts mm -hmm. and um, that was what I was looking for with the cyanotype workshops was to to create something that's a very basic kind of experiment that has so many potential possibilities for painters, for photographers, for sculptors. Um, and hopefully, when through doing that, that they were able to see your exhibition a little bit more clearly, you right. know, that, that um, having a poet respond in mm -hmm. the space with a poem about nature kind of um, makes people reflect on the kind of poetry at play in your work, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, something had to get their hands dirty with a process, I think makes people look a at this as something made. Right. Um, yeah, so as far as um, seeing the public's response, I, I, you know, we've been trying to, to sort of weave in a lot of social media things. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any responses on, on that? Uh, that's the exciting part for me is when I can see how people are experiencing my work through the things that they post on, in, on right. Instagram or social media platforms. So that that's always exciting for me to see that um, to see the kinds of pictures people are making of my work um, and how they're touching, sensing, engaging. Okay. I got so many direct messages about um, how grateful they were to experience the work, and mm -hmm. that was really exciting. That people who don't know me didn't they weren't even familiar with my work can have such a strong, um, impactful, and profound, in some instances, uh, experiences with it. Right. And we definitely got messages from people that they would r repeatedly view this exhibition. Yeah. You know, it became part of their environment, which was really encouraging because that's not always the case. You know, right. um, I think part of the, the great thing about a, an immersive installation is that it feels also like going to a park. You know, right. it's like something you want to return to. It's not you don't always have to go for the delivery of information but mm -hmm. it's also just the, the sort of embodied being with the things right. and we heard so much that that was like one of the the most um, strongest elements of, of this show was oh, that that's great. yeah that they felt comfortable you know we had students that were coming in every day you know mm -hmm. sitting in the hammocks reading um, so great. talking you know yeah. um, and you know, for me, like that's rare in exhibitions. People don't always feel comfortable mm -hmm. co consistently being in the space. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're in a mode of consumption mm -hmm. rather than sort of contemplation or or being with or alongside artwork. Right. Um, so, yeah, the the last thing I, j I just want to um, talk about briefly is is what we try to do to 
keep our audiences engaged. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that from a curatorial perspective, and I think from an artist perspective, I think all artists want this, is that um, it's finding ways to actually think of your audience, mm -hmm. you know? You don't think of them first, but once we display things, it's always like, who are the people that can respond to this? And this may be scholars, this may be other artists. Right. And I think you've been really open about letting people do stuff. Right, touch things. Yes, and I think that that's <laughs> so important. Yeah. I think it's refreshing. I can, yeah. I know, I can see the reactions. Um, you know, we had a groups of stu school children in here mm -hmm. at some point. And as soon as I said, don't be shy, mm -hmm. you know, touch gently, um, they were all over it, <laughs> you know, which was, it was really That's great. Because right. yeah. um, I think it, it breaks down those barriers between the artwork and the audience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, that, that was exciting, too, to have um, all the library resources embedded in this installation. That was something unexpected, but I was hoping that people would really sit down and read mm -hmm. a book and um, start to make connections between the carefully curated books and what, what they were immersed in. Right. The other unexpected thing was um, your interest in all the work that I did in Iceland and, and right. trying to find a space for that in this exhibition. Right. I never would have done that without your encouragement. Yeah. And then um, we found the perfect way to use all of these volcano watercolors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and that, that I think <laughs> also is surprising to people. Yeah. And I think for students to understand that, like, you're also um, mixing with the world. So mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, the Amy Amy Bobian experience is is isolated, right. but it's also taking in. It's, right. you know, it's, it's networking out. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that that was, I, I think, a learning thing for everyone, and I also think it, it allows us to reinvigorate things that we may have in storage, or, yeah, you know, definitely. or that you have in storage, like the Iceland yeah, pieces. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it was really exciting to see it in here yeah. and see that kind of like as this timeline or yeah. hor horizon, horizon line through this space. Yes, and I thought that was important too because, number one, it, it engages the wall, but it mm -hmm. also provides kind of a, um, a more personal tone, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I think even though your hands are kind of all over right. the exhibition, right. um, photographs themselves have a more kind of um, personal engagement, like it's a window mm -hmm. into someone's kind of world or psyche, and I, um, whereas yours kind of push that back, you know? Mm -hmm. they're, always, they're always woven into something, or collage is always like a friction between things. It's a surface more than a, a window. Right. Um, yeah, I think that that adds um, a nice kind of psychological dimension. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It definitely makes me think about like what is going to be next because yeah. with the ins each installation I'm trying to push things further, so right. we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
that the ways that nature is so adaptive to the changing environment is captivating. And trying to pay close attention to the ways our environment is changing around us um, is, is complicated. It's hard, to, it's hard to really be attentive to all those details. So uh, I try to slow down and really look at the ways that different species kind of relate to each other and how everything is interconnected and interdependent on each other. And then figure out ways that um, I can find parallels in the environments that I'm creating.